makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. A very good morning and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Manus Cranny in Dubai. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Chinese stocks continue their slide after banks make a smaller than expected cut to their benchmark lending rate but fail to trim the reference rate for mortgages. European energy stocks are higher. Fears of a potential strike hitting Australian gas exports. City CEO Jane Fraser is reported to be planning a breakup of the bank's biggest unit in a restructuring that would give her more power. Plus, BRICS leaders are gathering in Johannesburg to try and challenge the Western dominance of global finance. We'll discuss the man who coined the moniker of the block. Jim O'Neill joins The Pulse, the former chairman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. So we started in the red, but we're drifting higher across the European complex. Why? Because of this angst over gas prices. That's the debilitating story from Australia. They could be on strike, yet storage is quite full. European equity markets are up. We break of trend. Three weeks on the downside, we break uh, of trend there. The issue is just how bad are things in China? And what is the transmission mechanism of policy to the real economy? How do you look at the European map? Morgan Stanley do warn that you have a potential. Let's have a look at the cross assets uh, instead. Uh, I can tell you that across the asset board, you've got 10-year government bond yields at the highest since 2007. We're up 32 bips in the space of this August alone. 30-year paper, it'll come up at the bottom of your screen, the highest since 2011. Again, are the bond vigilantes awakened? Edudani on Friday on Bloomberg says he sees them and it's concerned about federal deficits in a rising interest rate environment. So the vigilantes are awakened. The question is how much more uh, can they deliver a pooch on 10-year government bond yields? Or is it Bob Michael? Buy everything. I love that. Buy everything. There's the consequence on the European gas markets. We are up by just under 8 and a quarter percent. We have the threat of an LNG workers strike in Australia. Even though Europe doesn't buy a great deal of its gas from Australia, the risk is this. Competition with Asia for gas. So you're seeing uh, gas prices spike. And Brent up 7 tenths of 1 percent. Again, the honeymoon was over last week, wasn't it? Seven weeks of gains. Doof off 2.3%. People are worried about China. They're worried about the overall recovery narrative. Bitcoin, I just thought we'd show you that as yields career towards a 15-year high. Bitcoin took a tank. A billion dollars of liquidations in 24 hours on Friday. Gives you a sense of the debilitation of 15-year high yields has on overall, in theory, pro-risk assets. Well, the Chinese banks have made a smaller than expected cut to their benchmark lending rate but avoided trimming the reference rate for mortgages. This is after the PBOC told the banks over the weekend, support the flagging Chinese economy with increased lending. Sophia Orta Acosta is with me. So if we're to dilute all of this, the, the loan prime rate is the, is the benchmark, but it's not being transmitted. That cut in the loan prime rate is not being transmitted thus far to the mortgage market. Is it a stumbling block, uh, a, a, a failure to launch? How would you describe uh, the lack of engagement in the policy initiative. Sophia. Morning, Manu. So uh, this is a complicated, very complicated uh, policy transmission mechanism because essentially what happened is the central bank cut interest rates last week, uh, which was incredibly unexpected. I mean, uh, even though uh, authorities have been saying that they will support um, the property market and the broader economy with cheaper loans, nobody had expected uh, them to do that um, last week already. So the follow through was expected to, to come today. So what happens, Manus, is banks set these loan prime rates. It's the one year and the five year. The five year is the one that matters because that underpins mortgages and that was left unchanged. What banks are doing is essentially protecting their net interest margins, their profitability here. If authorities in Beijing are, tend are telling them to lend more, they need to kind of hold on uh, to those basis points. This is incredibly important for the financial system and it was one of the key complaints from the ho whole industry last year when Beijing was, was telling banks to, you know, to play their role in supporting growth and in, in injecting the economy with credit, they were saying we can't afford to do this. So clearly banks, um, you know, Beijing is listening to banks. It's important for them to protect their balance sheet. Uh, and if they need to lend more, then they need to be, uh, 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 they need to afford to do it. The, the thing is, uh, Manus, the market is reading this negatively because the market expects Beijing, banks and everyone with authority in China to throw everything they can at supporting growth, supporting sentiments. And that's not what they got today. 
I mean, probably one of the most read stories on the Bloomberg today is why run it cold? You know, run it cold, Xi Jinping is letting Chinese economy fail. But here lies the point. Many people will ask the question, lending to mortgages is just fueling the same kind of cycle we lived in before. The more important thing is to grapple with the debt, the debt at a local government level. And again, we're seeing initiatives, which my guests this morning are saying are not enough, to help the local government funding vehicles, refinancing. What are the details? Yeah, exactly. I think this is in, this is very important context, and this is a very uh, really well written story by my colleagues at China. Everyone should read it. Um, but essentially, what uh, Beijing is doing right now is trying a very painful restructuring of the economy, of the entire economy. The property sector is a huge chunk of that uh, because of essentially the hangover from how authorities dealt with the aftermath of the global financial crisis in 2007, 2008. Was they injected? all this cheap liquidity into the financial system uh, and now that's the the debt overhang from that um, that they're trying to uh, to, to uh, essentially deal with it's really a really really complicated thing that Xi Jinping is trying to do the downturn in the property market and I keep reminding people this was deliberate this was something engineered by Beijing there was a bubble there so many of uh, Chinese households had the majority of their savings in property some some people had one two three properties this was a bubble that needed to burst that needed to be dealt with maybe not burst but deflated but deflating a property bubble is incredibly difficult and the difficult thing and what Beijing is, tr is, is really finding out now is that when that downward spiral begins, it's very, very difficult to then stop it because you have this kind of crisis of confidence and people are not quite sure how and when the market will drop. So they're expecting the market to keep dropping. And even though banks are offering cheaper credits, mortgage rates are record lows, corporate loans are record lows, no one wants them. And people are using this to essentially refinance. So you have a, an economy that's in deleveraging mode. This was intentional by Beijing, but it's not growing either. So that's why everyone is comparing this to Japan and what happened there. And it's really, really a balance sheet recession already in the works, Manus. Yeah, uh, a lot. I think it'll be more than a lost decade if it, if it comes to pass and reflects on what happened in Japan. Um, Sophia, thank you very much, Sophia Ota Acosta, putting the Chinese policy responses in context. Well, one lady who is taking her scythe to structure, it is the CEO, Jane Fraser, over at City, reported to be weighing a new plan. Break up the bank's biggest unit. It's a restructuring that would, many people say, give her more power. You've got the FT writing and breaking their story. Uh, the Wall Street firm is looking at splitting what's called the Institutional Clients Group in three. Now, if you think of the Institutional Clients Group, uh, what you've got here. This was created under Vikram Pandit back in 2009, and it is perhaps uh, the most important parts of City. Uh, because if you think about it, the ICG unit brought in 41 billion bucks of revenue last year, 10.7 um, billion of the 14.8 net income. So that gives you a sense of just how important this is. And if we think of the segments that are going to be broken up and run, well, I say broken up, it's perhaps more focused. Investment in corporate banking, we know that that's been brutal for Wall Street and the rest of the world over this year so far. Global markets and transaction services. Of course, within global markets, you have the rates business, etc. And then you have transaction services around the world. So what does it do for Jane Fraser? Well, there was an exit of one of her top real top executives, Paco Yabara. He exited. He'd been with the institution 36 years. He's gone. This is about remoulding and crafting a bank in your own image. Every CEO wants to do it. Jamie Dimon crafts JP Morgan under the pillars that he envisages. Armati does it at UBS. And you are seeing uh, the similar moves at Bank of America. Long tenured CEOs. Well, this is Jane Fraser, I think, evolving her stamp on City. I'll leave you with those thoughts. Coming up in the show, global investors, what are the risks? Well, there's narratives to come from the ECB president, Christine Lagarde, the federal chair, Jerome Powell, and they will all be donning the Stetsons. I'm being facetious, of course, at Jackson Hole. What will they have to say to markets on monetary policy on Bloomberg?
will look towards uh, the Jackson Hole Symposium for, for color on kind of the duration of how long we stay in this restrictive territory. I think he's going to reiterate this view that they could stay higher for longer. I don't really think that we're going to have, we're going to hear uh, a big change in narrative. I don't think Chairman Powell can deviate from the current situation where we're, we're, we're waiting for more data. Probably comes down to, you know, what is it, you know, inflation data look like? We're data dependent and there's nothing else that we can say at the moment until we get more data. Probably not, you know, a real reason to rock the boat at Jackson Hole. I think he is likely to sound in tone a bit on the hawkish side to keep the optionality open in case they need to hike more. And there's really not a lot, you know, to, to say at this point. Inflation's coming down and that's a, a great thing for the Fed. RM Live Pulse survey this week looking into investors' expectations around the Fed's forward path for monetary policy and Chair Jerome Powell's speech this coming Friday. Nicola Mai is portfolio manager, sovereign credit analyst over at PIMCO. Um, good to have you with me. Timely, isn't it? 32 basis points in the space of August gone on to the, the slightly longer end. How nervous will Jerome Powell be with the... Uh, volatility, one could say, and the explosion higher in yields. How unnerving is that for Chair Powell this week? Good morning. Good morning. Um, well, I'm not sure I would call it unnerving for Chair Powell. Let's remember that the Fed is determined to bring inflation down and the tightening in financial conditions that we've seen is something that the Fed has been aiming for. And actually, given that a lot of the mortgages in the U.S. are long mortgages, uh, you know, some rise in, in longer yields actually makes the monetary tightening somewhat more effective. And I think the Fed will um, is data dependent from here. It's done or nearly done, uh, but it's going to watch the data closely. I mean, you talk about the mortgage rates in the United States of America, but it's had a limited impact so far. The long variable lag has been limited in its arrival. Um, we caught up with Grantham uh, at the end of last week, and he said, well, the Fed are always wrong. They, they, never, they never really call it right. Is, is there something much harder and more oppressive to come in the U.S. economy, in your view? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, the economy has held up remarkably well, given how much tightening there has been in terms of policy rates. I think there are different uh, reasons for that. I mean, one of them is there is still excess savings in the economy, which is the counterpart mm. of the big fiscal stimulus uh, during the pandemic. Some of it is the extension of the loan maturities um, for both households and corporates. Um, and, um, and I think it could also be that fiscal policy, in truth, is more stimul stimulative than it appears. Uh, as we've seen, for example, from the rise in, in the U.S. deficit. Um, but, but I also think that simply, uh, you know, there are lags, uh, long and variable lags when it comes to monetary policy. And if you look at previous cycles, actually the peak impact of policy rates um, of tightening cycles tend to be six to eight quarters after the start of the cycle. And let's remember the Fed started to hike in March 2022 at the start of 2022. And so I think as we get towards the end of this year, I think, especially with longer yields now rising, we should see uh, an additional impact on the economy. I, I mean, there's a number of narratives out there from the people that we've spoken to. Ed Udani warns that the Bolden vigilantes have been woken from their slumber. And I suppose this takes me to the next question is, um, Stephen Major thinks it's a good opportunity to step in at 4.2, 4.3%. But if bond vigilantes are only reawakening, what is the risk in a deficit rising, supply orientated backdrop to the bond market of materially higher nominal and real rates? Yeah, so I, we subscribe to the, to the view that the equilibrium interest rate in the US remains pretty low. Uh, you know, for reasons uh, which have not changed since before the pandemic, among them uh, demographics. They are changing, but they're changing over a very long period of time. Another one is, is uh, inequality, which remains wide. Uh, and generally speaking, we think there is a savings glut globally that, that ultimately keeps medium term rates low. Um, and as a result, I think, you know, I think um, the market is already pricing a fairly high 
um, rates. So if you look at the 10-year uh, real rate in the U.S. So is this transitory? Do you think 4.2, 4.3% and... is transitory and we will roll down quickly? I think we're close to the upper end of the Treasury range that we've been expecting. And so I think bonds look pretty attractive here. Uh, now, the word transitory is a word that has been used, probably overused. What I would say is, until we get a bit more, more clarity about the inflation outlook, you know, we could stay at fairly high yield levels. But yes, I think in equilibrium, uh, Treasury yields will settle uh, at a lower level from here. Okay. Uh, does that compound your underweight? dollar narrative. I mean, last week, it's amazing, isn't it, how analysts, you know, oh, it's risk on, risk off drives the dollar. Oh, no, it's rates that drive the dollar. Oh, well, maybe it's back to risk. I, I mean, it depends which week you ask an analyst. But I'm looking at your narrative, and it is underweight the dollar. Um, why? Mm -hmm. And what is the alpha for that? So there's a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, broadly speaking, if you look at most valuation metrics, the dollar looks expensive um, against uh, most currencies. Uh, secondly, I think the US disinflation cycle and the interest rate cycle is more advanced uh, than in other places. Uh, so the Fed started hiking well before the ECB, for example. Um, you know, inflation has started to st slow in the U.S. more quickly than it has in Europe and in several other places. So I think when it comes to the rate cycle, I think the Fed is ahead. Uh, you know, the pause came earlier, whereas, for example, in the case of the ECB and the Bank of England, I think they have a bit more tightening to do. Um, and, and as a result, I think the, the rate differential uh, is, uh, is likely to support, to support the dollar underweight uh, position. Um, in addition, I would say that, you know, the dollar tends to do well when there is big risk off events like a deep recession because of the hedge value of the dollar. And we do see a very weak mm. growth slash recessionary environment over the next year, but we don't see a deep recession. So that's, I think the combination of all these factors make us, uh, you know, be underweight the dollar against currencies that we find uh, relatively cheap. How anxious are you about China on the globe? If I look at global risk, every week I had an analyst on telling me, China's reopening, buy commodities. China's reopening, buy risk. China's reopening, the velocity's on the up. Here we are. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the distance between reality and fantasy is really quite, or reality and hope is quite a broad gap. Here we are, our hopes are being dashed. For global risk, how important is the slowdown, the FX intervention in China, how concerning is that for global risk? Yeah, well, I think China is certainly underperforming relative to most expectations. And I think a lot of it has to do with the weakness of the property sector and the policymakers' um, support being fairly piecemeal. Now, I don't think the policymakers will allow a financial crisis to unfold in China, but it appears to me that, you know, the, the support measures that are being uh, delivered, including some modest rate cuts and some fiscal easing, are fairly, are fairly modest. Uh, now, what is the risk? I, th I think at the margin, China will be a source of weakness for the global economy, and it will help to uh, contribute to the disinflation that we should see ahead, which is actually positive news in a way for, for Western central banks, uh, which are trying to aim for the disinflation. Um, now, I don't, think, I, I don't think it will be something that causes a global crash, uh, you know, partly because, uh, you know, I think the Chinese financial sector, which is obviously going through some wobbles, is not very intertwined with the rest of the global economy. Um, and from a trade perspective, I would say at the margin, uh, you know, the Chinese economy is less uh, connected to, to the rest of the globe. And especially when it comes to the service sector, that's very much a, a domestic issue. So China imparting some weakness, some disinflation, uh, okay. but not really causing a global crash. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe we're just a little bit more emotionally engaged with China than we are financially exposed. Uh, Nicola May, thank you so much. Portfolio Manager, Sovereign Credit Analyst at PIMCO on Bloomberg this Monday morning.
Are you long Bitcoin? Are you nervous? Global risk has been upended by 15-year high in interest rates. This has irked some of the cryptocurrency markets. Bitcoin, I can tell you now, with a little bit of a flurry on an upside, it always happens. You go out on a Saturday, have a couple of glasses of wine, buy a bit of Bitcoin. Up she went, but the trend is there, which is down four. We're going into session number eight, and we're in correction territory, down 11.45%. Uh, you have mass liquidations. A billion dollars was liquidated in the 24 hours in Friday's ruckus. Uh, the question is, have we lower to go? A quick snapshot of global risk across the asset board. You've got gas flying higher on angst about strikes in Australia. You have equities in Europe prevaricating after they, I suppose, had a pretty brutal time for the past three weeks. Global equities uh, on nervous ahead of Jackson Hole. Chinese stocks continue the slide after banks make a smaller than expected cut to their benchmark lending rate but fail to trim the reference rate to four mortgages. European energy stocks are higher with fears of a potential strike hitting Australian gas exports. City CEO Jane Fraser is reported to be planning a breakup of the bank's biggest unit in restructuring that would give her more power. Plus, BRICS leaders gather in Johannesburg to try and challenge the Western dominance of global finance. We discuss that with the man who coined the moniker of the block, Jim O'Neill, the former chairman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management, with us in just a moment. Good morning. Welcome. It's The Pulse. Monday morning, I'm Manish Cranny setting the at-risk agenda for you. Well, the South African president, Cyril Ramaphosa, has expressed support for the expansion of the BRICS group of an emerging market powers. Bloomberg's Jen Zabazaja looks into the background of the bloc and why the more than 40 countries have now expressed an interest in joining the club. BRICS or Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. It's gone from an acronym to a powerful club that dozens of countries across the political spectrum want to join. The term was coined by economist Jim O'Neill in 2001, and it was meant to highlight the rapid growth seen in these emerging economies. Initially BRIC, the S joined in 2010, extending the group's membership to Africa, to four continents, nearly a quarter of global GDP, and about a fifth of world trade. These nations saw their collective voice as a way to exert greater influence in a US-dominated world. But much like other multilateral forums, such as the G7, producing an agreement at its annual gathering has become one of the biggest challenges. Now, more than 40 countries have expressed interest in joining the club, many of which are African. The BRICS partners are significant investors in Africa. Among the items on this year's agenda will be how to boost the influence of the so-called Global South in multilateral institutions such as the United Nations. BRICS accounts for 42% of the world's population, but still only 15% of voting rights at the IMF and the World Bank. With the IMF predicting these nations' growth rates will soon surpass those of the G7, BRICS want a bigger voice in these bodies. And that's why some say this year's summit could prove critical for the future of the BRICS in an increasingly multipolar world. Potent imagery there of the upcoming BRICS summit. Jen Zabazaja, our Africa correspondent, is with me now. Jen, the expansion plans is something you and I have touched on this morning when we were chatting. Is it a threat to world order? Is that the correct way to, to look at this? Manus, I think it depends on who you speak with. What we've been hearing from leaders over the past few weeks uh, is that it's not meant to be anti-West or, or counter the U.S. by any means. Uh, but a lot of people are looking at sort of the, the countries that have applied or are potentially looking to be a part of BRICS and saying that, you know, what could this potentially mean for the future of BRICS? As you mentioned, there's 40 countries that have expressed interest, but we heard from Cyril Ramaphosa, President Cyril Ramaphosa last night, there's only 20 countries, uh, more than 20 countries, excuse me, that 
that have formally uh, applied. And, and what he said, what he reiterated to the country uh, on Sunday night in his state address uh, is that it's, it's despite a lot of these countries having differing political views, uh, despite them being on different sides of the political spectrum, they all shared uh, an aspiration for a more balanced global order. Uh, and so, you know, it, we'll have to see whether or not there's other countries that will potentially be added into this block this year, but definitely something that we, we heard him reiterate his, uh, his interest in it last night. Indeed. Well, look, joining yourself and myself now, uh, let's bring in the man who coined that phrase, BRICS. We're joined by Jim O'Neill, the former Goldman Sachs Asset Management Chairman. Uh, Jim, good to see you this morning. Uh, I think the last, when I broke this news, it was in 2001, I was at CNBC. It was our future. It was bright. It, it was radiant. Has it really, has it failed to live up to what you ever thought it was going to be, Jim? I mean, De Silva uh, talks about it as being something he wants, a stronger political and financial BRICS. Where are we in the ascendance of BRICS? Jim, good morning. Good morning. Um, thanks for having me on. Um, well, it's not straightforward. Uh, economically, uh, the only reason why the group is that interesting, frankly, is because, of course, China. Um, China of the four countries that I um, thought should be in the acronym, um, <laughs> didn't include South Africa, as you said, in, as Jen said in the report initially. Um, China is the only one that uh, has grown more than any of the assumptions we ever made, despite its um, own disappointments the last five years. Uh, India got close, but Brazil, Russia and South Africa uh, have all been, uh, particularly since 2010, extremely disappointing. Um, and so it, it, it's an uneven group. Uh, and, and without China and without India, I don't think uh, it would be that interesting at all, economically. Um, and, and amongst the, the second thing to say is amongst the, the many complications I have going around my head about this it's a possible expansion is uh, economically, none of, not many of the countries that are applying to join are particularly large. Um, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure what it is they're trying to achieve, which takes me to the third point, is that ever since they set up the political grouping um, and South Africa's presence, it's, it's been, again, as Jen uh, showed in her brief segment, uh, it's been very disappointing. Um, at, at a minimum, you would expect they would focus on doing something to improve their collective growth rates, and uh, if anything, as I sometimes tease BRICS leaders about and their advisors, the opposite has happened. So that, and they've had enough difficulty trying to agree just between the five of them. So beyond the admittedly hugely powerful symbolism, I'm not quite sure what having a lot more countries in there is going to achieve. So, so then, Jim, what, what would then change your perspective on it? I mean, there's been a lot of talk leading up to this summit uh, about potentially moving away from the dollar. Could that potentially be the catalyst that changes any sort of success, future success for the BRICS grouping? I mean, what I would really like to see is the two big places, China and India, being a lot serious about um, sharing responsibilities and having serious focus on joint initiatives. In reality, when you get away from the, the, the staged geopolitics of it, China and India rarely get in a room to discuss anything. Uh, but because of the size of their populations and because of their significant uh, size economically, if these two countries were serious about global trade and serious about uh, climate change and serious about infectious disease prevention, then automatically the BRICS thing would become uh, massive. Uh, and issues about uh, the dollar uh, would follow from that. All these grandiose statements of which the, the kind of craziest is the one uh, I, I think is associated recently with Lula from Brazil about replacing the dollar with a new currency. I mean, it's just... It's kind of madness, really. Um, if they are serious about trying to pursue initiatives where each of their currencies are going to be used more for trade between themselves, and if it allowed to 
result in some opening up of their own uh, financial markets, then that would be a beginning of lesser role of the dollar. But by just making these grandiose statements, uh, it, you know, it's kind of a bit meaningless after it's gone beyond the the fun and games for you guys in the in the media world, to be honest. What, what then, Jim, would potentially, I, I mean, as we mentioned, there's a number of countries that are interested in potentially being a part of this block. Are there any specific additions to the BRICS that mm. could bolster uh, the, the grouping? I mean, you mentioned China and India uh, having significant influence. Who else potentially could come in uh, that could, again, you know, counter the G7 potentially? Well, I mean, I just want to make it clear, in, in, in my opinion, what, what we should really see going on from a global perspective is the existing entity, which the BRICS are already part of, along with the G7, the G20, should be, should be given a lot of attention by every country to be the central thing for global governance. Having these competing things going on is, is not helping anyone. The, the G7, in my opinion, is not far off being a waste of time either. Um, that being said, I do think the symbolism of the BRICS and any BRICS expansion it is important because it does highlight the feelings of the global south that they're not adequately represented. And in that sense, I think if I find myself thinking Saudi Arabia, particularly given its, its role as the world's biggest swing oil producer, and of course, given its closeness historically with the United States, I think they joining, uh, which I imagine if anybody's joining, it will include them, uh, is a pretty big deal. Uh, and then economically, I think the likes of Indonesia, um, which in some ways is arguably the country that has the most legitimate gripe about never being included by, by me in the first place, uh, is obviously really important given how well they've done for the past 20 years. I, I can't resist in saying with it being in South Africa and you being there, Jen, with all, all the countries about Africa being dis, around Africa being discussed, you know, why, why isn't Nigeria on, on the agenda? It's already a bigger country uh, economically than South Africa, and it's 20% of Africa's population. And so even if you get beyond the symbolism, what are the criteria for countries that are going in and not and are not even being considered? And it doesn't seem to me... Uh, there's been a lot of thought even given to that. Jim, let's just pick up on the Saudi aspect. I sit in Dubai. We've just seen this major initiative. You can criticize it. You can pillory it, whatever. But the Saudis corralled a lot of the global south to a meeting over the Ukraine war with Russia. They are having their moment in, in, in the global political sun, excuse the pun, in the middle of summer. But what you said that it could be important if Saudi comes on board into the new development bank. It does it be beef up the new development bank. What is it that you would say, Manus, Jen, Saudi coming in or the UAE asking perhaps um, to, to become more integral? What would change? What would, what would that change within the narrative? Would it be the finance, the politics? You're asking me, yeah? Yeah. I mean, I think the most obvious thing is, is if they were uh, going into it with a with a regard to it being a substantive thing for themselves, the first thing is whether they then start uh, actually pricing their oil to all these buyers in local currency and not in the dollar. Um, and again, as as some of your uh, readers and followers will know, but on on and off for best part of forty years, going all the way back to the oil price crisis of the of the seventies. Um, there was talk then about oil producers um, pricing in something other than the dollar. In those days, it was typically yeah. Deutschmarks. Yeah. Um, so that, that would be hugely significant if it were true. What is interesting in this regard is, of course, uh, the Saudis are reaching out uh, all over the place. Uh, in the UK, late last week, there's a lot of focus and some controversy about it, about some kind of official or formal visit from uh, MBJ to the UK soon. Um, so uh, the, the, there will be a sort of a fighting for spoils as to who's South, uh, South, Saudi Arabia's closest friend, I guess. Uh, but I, I think uh, along, along with the pricing thing, the fact that they are such hugely important uh, oil producers uh, would, would clearly add uh, important uh, 
conceptual weight to, to whatever the bricks we're, we're going to try and talk about going forward. But as again, as Jen touched on at the start of the program, there's a huge difference between talking about stuff and actually doing something. And for the bricks to really start to be more effective, irrelevant of who's in it or not, they've got to start trying to do things rather than just meeting once a year and making very grand symbolic statements and then nothing, nothing of substance ever really happening. Jim, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, we didn't get to women's football, so you're safe from having to answer on where the next <laughs> investment opportunity is there. Jim, <laughs> Jim O'Neill and Jen Zabazaja are on the BRICS Summit. Let's see what the news flow uh, gives us, what the news gods deliver. Jim O'Neill there. Coming up, Ukraine has been promised additional fighter jets by Denmark and the Netherlands. We bring you the story right here from Maria Tadeo on Bloomberg. This week, Bloomberg is live from the annual Jackson Hole Economic Symposium. Our expert team speaks with Fed presidents and other economic leaders as they deliberate the shifting global economy. What is the response mechanism? It's not how fast we do it, it's where we go. Coverage starts Wednesday, August 23rd with a special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance live from Jackson Hole on Friday, August 25th, starting at 8 a.m. Eastern. Bloomberg, your global business authority. Denmark and the Netherlands have pledged to send F-16 fighter jets to Kyiv during the surprise visit by the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky. Let's get more on the story with our Europe correspondent, Maria Tadeo. Maria, how significant is this moment? I mean, we've heard a lot about uh, calls from Zelensky for these aeroplanes for months and months. So talk me through the significance. Yes, uh, Manus, and it is significant to the extent that we actually have some lines now coming from the Ukrainian uh, foreign minister. Again, uh, the delivery of the planes would happen in the context of the counteroffensive. And remember, Manus, there has been now numerous reports suggesting that perhaps, uh, well, the counteroffensive is not going as fast as expected. Some have talked about disappointment. The Ukrainian uh, foreign minister actually says this could help uh, and be very important in this counteroffensive and also says anyone who criticizes uh, Ukraine for being slow, quote, you you should try to do this uh, yourself. So that encapsulates some of the tension uh, in the story. Now, in terms of the fighter jets itself, there's two major questions. One is, when will Ukraine actually get them? And a lot of that will depend on the training of the pilots. Remember, it was conditional to the training. Yesterday, the Dutch Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, said that September looks too soon, but hopefully uh, soon after, he suggested. The amount, the Dutch we know have 42 F-16s in stock. Does it mean Ukraine gets the 42? That's a question because President Zelensky indicated they would, but Mark Rutte would not put a number on it. When it comes to Denmark, however, they have 19. And yesterday, it seems that, yes, they will get the full 19. But again, the big question is just how far, especially in this context of the counteroffensive. Well, look, speaking of NATO, and Orban and Erdogan met over the weekend. They discussed Sweden's bid to join NATO. Is that part of the agenda, we understand? Yes, and they talked about, uh, well, geopolitics overall, uh, NATO and energy too. And again, it is important to really stress the threat that connects uh, these two countries on the diplomatic front is the fact that they have not ratified the bid for NATO and, and Sweden to join uh, the alliance. Uh, President Erdogan gave the political go-ahead, but we do not have the ratification from the Turkish parliament nor the Hungarian parliament. Now, we know why there's a delay in the Turkish one, they had to, well, look through a memorandum and President Erdogan wanted to see uh, Sweden doing more when it comes to terrorism. But when it comes to Hungary, there's no memorandum. So it is unclear as to why the Hungarians are pulling back and they haven't ratified this yet. It is bad news to some extent for Sweden because we're getting back to September, the end of the summer break, and they still do not have a vote or a date for this vote to happen. Maria. I, tell you, I take it you were watching the football yesterday, where you must be the happiest person in Brussels today, are you? 
Yes, I'm always happy, but today I'm extra happy, Manis. And uh, look, it was excellent, great win. I'm very happy. And also, I would say it was not just a football win, but a diplomatic win because the Spanish queen got on the plane and went to Australia when it's a big event oh, like this. Oh, you're going into dangerous to territory. You're but, doing, but you you're have going, to you've show just, up, you've gone, into the, you've gone into the bullet zone, Maria. <laughs> it was going so well. It was going so well. But you went you right on the rails. Okay, up. well, we'll leave that for... I'm an Irish man. We don't have royalty where I'm from, technically. Maria Tadeo in Brussels uh, with the very latest on the World Cup and geopolitics. Coming up, what have we got? $18 trillion economic powerhouse in Asia is decelerating. Why would the country's leader allow that to happen? Make sense of it on the most read story on Bloomberg this Monday morning. conversations that matter, the insights that you need. It's right here on The Pulse with me, Manish Cranny, in Dubai. Today, Bloomberg's Big Take takes a look at how President Xi's quest to rewrite China's economic playbook is facing its sternest test yet. Let's dig a little bit deeper into The Big Take with our Bloomberg Asia Economy and Government Executive Editor, Dan Tenk. Daniel, good to have you with me. Why isn't Beijing adding more stimulus? I mean, they're grappling with debt, an FX rate that's, some would say, becoming a little bit more unhinged. Why not do more and be more aggressive? Yeah, well, this really goes uh, to the heart of Xi Jinping's economic philosophy. And, and what he's trying to do is kind of break this model that China has had for decades um, to kind of pump up the economy with a lot of uh, debt-fueled uh, stimulus, uh, as they've done in the past, lots of spending on infrastructure, lots of spending on property um, in particular. What um, she is trying to do is uh, he doesn't want um, property, uh, which accounts for um, about a quarter of the economy, to keep, um, to keep going at this rate. You know, we're seeing uh, apartment buildings pop up, sort of ghost cities, uh, zombie uh, companies and all that. So what he's trying to do is basically put things on a more sustainable footing with what he calls high quality growth. And that's why we're seeing him kind of hold back right now. There's stuff he could do to keep this going. But China's at a level where, you know, the debt servicing uh, costs uh, that they're paying are not generating the, the returns in, in terms of growth that, that they did in the past. And what he's trying to do is essentially set them up for more sustainable growth over the long term. OK, well, that's that's the ambition uh, as he attends the BRICS summit uh, this week in South Africa. Let's see what kind of client that can bring to bear. Daniel Ten Kate, thank you very much on the big take. It's on your Bloomberg terminal this morning. One of the most read stories on Bloomberg. Uh, how to work the China economy. The state of play in markets as we uh, hand off to the surveillance early edition with Kriti Gupta. Natural gas on fire as the risk of strikes in uh, Australia, uh, I suppose, sends shutters through the gas markets in Europe. 